Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. I don't know if it's the sunshine or the delirium because of how far into this losing streak we are, but I am, and I'm being totally serious, 100% at peace with where the Red Wings are at in this season, in this playoff race, if you think they're in it anymore, with how they've been playing. I'm good. I, I've, I've fully processed everything. I, the perspective in both directions is understandable to me. I'm not bothered. Do you know what that qualifies you for? A padded room. A spot on the Detroit Red Wings roster. Oh, for being at peace? (laughs) For being completely okay with how things are going. You know what? A lot of people would say there's no way this defense could be worse. And that is actually one of the few ways you could actually test that theory. Because it would get worse. Hey, we've always wanted to throw an average Joe in the Olympics just to see how bad it could be. I'm I'm okay with if this is the time to experiment with it. Podcaster dies on the ice after first hit taken. Speed run any percent. I don't even know if you'd make it out of warm-ups. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The Red Wings have made this interesting. I'm not sure what people are expecting this episode. I don't know what we're expecting this episode, but I honestly feel more prepared for this one than the last one. And I, I think a lot of, and we're going to get into all this, but I think a lot of things that I was hanging on to I've just kind of let go of in terms of how much of an impact does Dylan Larkin have on this team? What is this team truly capable of? What was real and what wasn't when they were on their run good? And I'm not saying it was all fake. You'll see it in a a few moments here, but a lot has been illuminated and it just makes it a lot more understandable. Not that I'm giving up on the season by any means, but it's kind of like after you saw it happen again last night against Buffalo, you're like, one, the delirium makes you laugh. And two, yeah, you understand what this Red Wings team is, especially in the position that they're in. But we'll get into all that. Folks, welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast, here to talk to you about all things Detroit Red Wings hockey, which is both a lot and very little right now. The world of the NHL and more. I am one of your hosts, Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. On this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast, we're going to be recapping the Red Wings game that happened last night between last episode and this one against the Buffalo Sabres, which went about the same as the Arizona Coyotes game from recently. Uh, We'll be talking about storylines from that game, talking about the playoff race and where Detroit could possibly go in either direction, their schedule upcoming, uh, and the news that came out earlier today, which is ultimately not that big of news, but it it was kind of a flash in the pan in that the Red Wings had a little bit of a scrum between uh, Lucas Raymond and Ben Schrott in practice. Uh, We'll be offering some kind of broad strokes perspectives on the season as a whole, the Iser plan, so to speak, and just our thoughts on what this Red Wings team is at this juncture in the season with about 17 games left. We'll be getting into some NHL news. I'm sure Brad and I are going to argue about expansion. Uh, John Tortorella provided entertainment for everyone, which he's usually good for, and uh, everything else before overtime. Before all that, I want to let you know that this podcast is primarily supported by our Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash podcast if you want to support the show. Uh, You get access to some great benefits like the Patreon-exclusive Discord, as well as being entered into all of our giveaways. For example, we're giving away two tickets to every Red Wings home game, the vast majority going to our Patreon supporters. Additionally, you get access to our bonus overtime episodes, which record right after these main ones. So again, patreon.com slash podcast if you want to support the show. So last night was Detroit's last game on their four-game road trip. The obvious previous three games were losses, and the two games before that at home were losses. So Five-game losing streak coming into Buffalo. Buffalo, a bottom 10 team in the league. And, you know, we said last episode, to some degree, this is a must-win for Detroit. Or at the very least, they need to show a better performance like they did, for example, against Vegas. Which wasn't perfect, but they still played substantially better than they did against Arizona. And I got to tell you, after the first period, I was deciding which game was worse, Arizona or this Buffalo one. Because... Buffalo's four goals in the first period could have been more. They walked all over Detroit. The game ended 7-3. The only highlight in the first period was Ben Schrott finishing a a nice play from Raymond and Berggren, which at one point made it 2-1, and I thought, okay, maybe they can stem the bleeding here, but the game ultimately ended 7-3. The score got to 6-1 at one point. That was ugly. That was really, 
really ugly. That was a team that's given up. That's what that was. It's hard to not be over dramatic on a losing streak this extreme, this time of season, with the position they were in and the way they're losing games. But, you know, the Vegas game, yeah, they lost. It was a good game, though. They went, you know, punch for punch with one of the top teams in the league. It's about the only game on this streak where it felt like that was the case. Get waxed by Arizona, get waxed by Buffalo. You know, at least those are two Stanley Cup contenders. Get run out of the building by Colorado. I just... Moral victories don't matter, but having a couple in this losing streak would have been nice. Just just like, yeah, it breaks things go your way. Their PDO bender came back down to earth and they lost a couple close ones. Sure. I was telling you this story before we started recording. I almost won my coworker a bunch of money because uh, when it was 3-1, he thought the Red Wings might get back into it. I'm like, no, this game's going to end 7-2. Just and with it, the way they were playing. Yeah. And as a joke, he threw money on a 7-2 final score, and if it wasn't for a fluky late third-period goal, <laughs> he had it. Like, And it's because they've become so predictably bad. And it's not one department. Lion, sucked. Reimer, sucked. Defense, sucked. Offense, generated nothing. Like, there was a couple times in the first period where you thought they might get back into it. Kane and Debrink had actually set, created two really good chances neither of which yielded a shot on net because they either missed the net or double clutched the puck because their confidence is in the tank right now. Man, if we move that net a foot to the left to brink, it would score so often. He misses left a lot. Yeah, he's got, you know, the steal a golf ward. He's got the yips right now. He absolutely does. He can't score to save his life. It's not that he's not getting chances. It's not that him and Kane aren't creating chances. Nothing's going in. Started in the Florida game because we had two Patrick Kane breakaways and to bring it rung one off the post and they haven't been able to do much since then, at least in terms of finishing, you know, I'm going to say the Buffalo game was worse because I was mad after the Arizona game. And after the Buffalo game, it was kind of, you know, like acceptance. I hit that. You've stage. come to terms. Yeah, yeah. I've come, I've come to terms with like, is, I've been talking about the top of the show. Like it. Yeah. Yeah, like they're not, there's no moral victories here. This is a team that looks awful, is playing awful. The give a shit level seems to be at an all time low, like 1920. Dare I say the shades of last year when Ottawa, like basically just put the test out and the Red Wings failed it. They actually ate the test. That was, (laughs) that was two games though. This is a six games. When was the last six game stretch this bad? December 19. 20, the the awful, truly devastatingly bad season where they had a six game stretch where they got blown out four or five times. To clarify, Brad's not saying 104 years ago. He's saying yeah. 2019, 2020. They're, the yeah. team was returning from the war. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, then they're playing like they might have been. <laughs> but the, the defense, you say it wasn't one department. And I agree. They were bad across the board. Lyon, Lyon was getting shelled, but he also wasn't doing what Lyon did earlier. Like he... He was bad. Oh, if you want to put this on a scale, I can circle two spots on that roster where it was the worst. Was it all four goals that Schrott and Petrie were on for? In the first period, yeah. yeah. They they got fried. They got fried. I think it was the third or the fourth goal. I can't remember which, but I saw Petrie step up and I immediately went, why? And then boom, goal. And I was actually laughing the entire time because Zach Benson looked phenomenal out there. And mm. like, Evan must be having an mm. aneurysm right now. Mm. <laughs> well, I mean... It's not it's not a hard task for the Red Wings to make players look good right now, but he certainly had himself a game. It's not like I'm not trying to minimize the game, but I don't blame you, Brad, for saying like there was a lot of kind of acceptance after that, because after the Arizona game, you were like, wow, that was brutal. If you listen to our last episode, I think we were very honest about why the Red Wings could not come out with that effort. And then you had the Vegas game where you did a little bit better, but the, the result didn't go your way because it's Vegas. You had Reimer and that you're on a back-to-back with travel. That's what the likely result was always going to be. But then you had Buffalo. You had the extra day in rest where they stayed in Vegas. You, you had time to reset. Oh, so they had the Vegas flu. Well, should have did what Nashville did. No Vegas. No, you too. No sphere. Yeah. No sphere for you. But yeah, the... They had time to come into this. They had the Arizona game as the template of we can't let this happen again. Otherwise, this season actually is cooked. 
And then it happened again. And this team is frustrated, very obviously. We're going to talk about the Sherratt Raymond thing in practice in a little bit here, but obviously they didn't want to do this. Getting beat to pucks, they're getting, you know, exposed defensively. They're not getting the save from the goaltenders anymore, which that was a run hot, which was nice while it lasted, but it's just not working right now. And Dylan Larkin not being there, as much as I hate to admit it, is way bigger of a impact then maybe we even gave it credit for. And we acknowledge that Dylan Larkin is this team's MVP, their best player, and that it has massive effects. But even though it shouldn't be this bad, I think it's the acceptance that this is what it is. And this team, I believe they can rally and put together better performances. They're in the hole now in terms of momentum. But in the standings, as you'll see in a few moments here, they're not going to be that far out of it. Let's say they turn it around like they did from December to January, sure. But... Yeah, that performance, nothing in that Buffalo game inspired anything for me to think that this team has a lot left in terms of uh, how they're able to pull it together until Larkin comes back. I'm happy to be proven wrong, but genuinely, you'd have to go back to those those really low bottom of the bottom years, Brad. I think you're right, and I said the same thing last night. This is the worst hockey, this six-game stretch is the worst hockey I've seen since the roster was bad enough to justify poor performances like that. Yeah, that was like Giovanni Smith on the first line years. Yeah. Like, it was awful. And, you know, nobody here would have been surprised if there was regression in the last couple months of this season. I think we were probably a, a little guilty of ignoring a lot of the red flags throughout the season, even when they were winning. You know, their underlying numbers were still pretty bad. And goaltending was propping them up and their shooting percentage was propping them up. We referenced it a lot as this could be a possibility, might have downplayed it more than we should have. But even if that was all this is, shooting percentage regresses, safe percentage regresses, there's still going to be close games. That's more of the Vegas loss yeah. than that's the, the whole, Arizona and Buffalo I think that's losses. like the whole crux of it for me is like, you know, you watch a game, you can be frustrated when it's like we lost because – our defense was shit or our goal, our goaltending let us down or we just didn't produce enough. But right now it's like, I'm not frustrated. I'm just totally at a loss You're because resigned. everything is bad. <laughs> and you don't want to ever focus on intangibles too much because I've, we've referenced that at length and how it's the most overrated thing in the NHL. But from coaching to leadership to whoever the hell you want, they're coming out dead. Every game. Flat, dead, beatable. They're down 4 nothing before they realize that, oh, this isn't warm-ups anymore. It's... The first goal went in in a minute seven. A minute seven. How do you keep letting that happen? Well, Buffalo and Arizona, they're down three goals each game at the end of the first period. Like, I can't wrap my head around the compete. And again, it's nothing you can quantify. And it's stupid as all hell. But you can see it. Clear as day. They are just not battling out there. We'll talk about it in a minute, but like the stat that's driving me nuts that uh, after seeing the scrum in practice today, great. Ben Sherratt finally got under Lucas Raymond's skin and you know, they're battling it out and the heat of the practice and it's some intensity. Great. He had two registered hits last night. You can piss off the only guy that seems to give a shit on this stretch. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm of a different mind than you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thing. Like we're we're nitpicking here, but there's no give a shit in the game, so I'm not going to accept it in practice. Like it's it's a joke. This whole stretch is a joke. It I don't give a crap how sustainable, how good they were playing actually was. You had the cushion, 500 hockey gets you into the playoffs, and you roll out this six game losing streak with just beer league levels of intensity. And that, that's the last thing I'll say about this game is, you know, the, the anger and me calling out, all of us calling out that this is the worst stretch of hockey compared to what the roster can do that we've seen in a while. It's about how they're losing. You know, if Larkin goes out and their goalies get cold and all of a sudden your lines aren't clicking because Larkin's out and your defense is getting exposed because your defense has Jeff Petrie on the top four. Like it, that is going to lead to losses. We understand that. Five, three losses. You play a really solid cup contender. You get goalied by the other team. But when you get 
caved by basement feeders and you are just getting walked all over. You're getting your show run. They're dictating the ice at in every single third of the ice is dictated by the other team, which if you watch the game, that that's what happened for most of the stretches of these games. That's where the frustration comes in. If the Red Wings lost Larkin and they put up like a 400 points percentage and it was maybe one bad loss in there, but just the results weren't going their way, we would be annoyed and we would be, you know, fans would be angry, but you'd be able to point to things and say, yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. And this is one of the worst outcomes in terms of what's reasonably expected. Even with the bad defense, the goaltending, and you know Larkin being out, I do think the Red Wings had more in the tank than what they've put up over these six games. Just to cover it, uh, the Red Wings scored two more goals. Uh, Raymond on the power play from Fabry and Kane. Raymond is one of the few players you can point to and say he's actually been... I don't want to say he's been good. No one's really been great over these six games, but his effort has been noticeable even through the losing streak. He might be, and I mean this fully, literally, the one player on the team over this six games where you can go consistently, he looks like he cares. Yep, yep. Like, if, he's you, the if youngest, you had to pick one, it would be him. And he's the youngest player on this team. Again, give me this veteran leadership line. He's the youngest player on the team. And then in the third period, the goal that lost Brad's friend some money, Jake Wallman, uh, from Gosses Baron Mata, an all defense goal line, which is not good. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> all right. The Red Wings lost 7 3. Upcoming, they have three games before we record next episode. So, next episode, I think we have two outcomes. One, it's going to be we're going to be able to talk about continued small hope, or if this is disastrous, it might be it. They have Arizona at home. And boy, if you need a statement, you have Arizona at home on Thursday night, 7 p.m. Eastern, and then Saturday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern, you have Buffalo at home. The two teams who you just completely fell flat on your face in front of, completely derailed so much of the good work you've done this season. You have them at home, immediate opportunity to redeem yourselves. You, there's still no Larkin. Your goalies are still cold. You're still working with the same you know, Swiss cheese defense that you have. But if you're going to, you know, turn that scrum from practice into anything, you immediately have the same two teams in order. And then they have Pittsburgh on Sunday on the road, 6 p.m. Eastern, at which point we'll be back with you Sunday evening. The Red Wings, if you're going to make a lot of people look stupid, if you're going to make us look stupid, if you're going to make the angry fan base look stupid for overreacting, that's the opportunity to do it. it, it Dare I say litmus test? Oh. Week three of litmus tests? <laughs> My God. I, our litmus test went from Colorado to Vegas to the <laughs> damn Arizona Coyotes. <laughs> hey, we're just reactive here. That, well, keep it in line with the Red Wings. That's their their upcoming schedule. They're going to need, need, need to dig deep. Valeno also left last night's game hurt so there he was skating today i heard whatever it is they have to show up as a completely different team a completely different team lines are all jumbled guys are are scrubbing it out in practice whatever you need to do the playoff standings right now and i know people are going to laugh hearing this but the Red Wings right now are the first team outside of the two wildcard spots. The Islanders have one fewer game played, same amount of points, 72. Detroit has the first tiebreaker. So if the Islanders lose again, and, and Detroit failed to capitalize on a perfect night of you know other teams' results in favor of the Red Wings' uh, playoff race, but if the Islanders lose again, then Detroit regains that wildcard spot if they lose that game in hand. Right behind Detroit is Washington, two games in hand, and they're three points back. So they play tonight too, and Washington could pass them. I'm saying this because Buffalo just thumped Detroit, so I think they deserve the respect to be mentioned here. But Buffalo has another game against Detroit; they're five points back and have one more game played. So it's a tall task for them. But if they win, you know, last night's game and then this upcoming game. Buffalo might have a stake to claim for a late run, and this would be the second season in a row they've done that. They're 6-3-1 in their last 10. Detroit isn't out of this mathematically. Their momentum, the way they're playing, you would be hard-pressed to find a Red Wings fan who's confident that they're going to turn it around. But we saw what happened when you know they went from late December to January. 17 games left. 
there's time to do it. There is time to do it. You like teams that have adversity throughout the season as like a build up to like understanding adversity during the playoffs. But man, do the Red Wings like to have long streaks of adversity. They, I would prefer if it was game over game and probably not while you're battling for your playoff life. But, you know, if something can be learned out of this and they actually come out next game like a team possessed or they absolutely just manhandle the Islanders on Thursday, then this is what maybe part of the growing process this team needed. So I know everybody's down in the dumps right now, but... It, the, this dance is not done yet. Like the Red Wings still are controlling their playoff destiny and they just have need to make some key wins here and they got to figure it out. There's no doubt about it. Am I confident that they're going to do it? No. That yeah, confident. right now I'm just sitting on the fence. I'm not going to make any grand gestures if I think they're definitely in the playoffs or definitely out and we need to start prospect profiles. I'm going to, I'm taking the wait and see approach with this because what turns out on the ice over the week over week, I don't even know anymore. I'm, I'm just going to tell you straight up. If they go 0-3 before our next episode, I'm talking about Macklin celebrating. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's And we always do the unrealistic it. one first because they, they're not getting Macklin celebrating. No, but, but if they go 0-3, most... that's, that's, it's cooked. They're, they're absolutely done. It, and it's not even that they go 0-3. It's Arizona <laughs> Buffalo and maybe the one other team in the league whose give a shit level is as low as theirs lately, which is Pittsburgh. I think if you lose nine in a row this time of the year, <laughs> you don't deserve to make the playoffs. And no one deserves to make the playoffs in the NHL in the salary cap era. But man, if if the Red Wings go lose nine in a row and squeak into the playoffs, there is no team in the playoffs that are afraid of the Red Wings. You know what? If the Red Wings lose nine in a row and make the playoffs, I'm with you on 32 is enough. <laughs> there's not <laughs> there's not enough teams to justify Clip it. Clip that. Clip that. <laughs> Evan, you're talking about this team coming out like a team possessed. And one thing that might lead to that is today there was some news that was put out that there was a scrum in practice between Ben Chirot and Lucas Raymond. I My initial thought was, okay, not the best for – you know, your own teammates be fighting each other, but this is a thing that happens in the NHL. It's not uncommon. And if they can turn that into energy, like at least it's displaying frustration with what they're doing. Like that doesn't happen really unless tempers are boiling over, unless it's some personal thing between guys, which I don't think is the case. I think this is just the whole team's pissed off. Then I'm actually fine with it. And then the video came out and I think it was just one of those battle drills where the guys, you know, a lot of shoving and it just, because the whole team is pissed off and frustrated. Ben Sherratt, for the night that he had, you have to understand why he's frustrated. And Lucas Raymond, who's been, as you rightly pointed out, Brad, battling harder, not just performing better, but battling harder than any other Red Wing over the stretch. He's frustrated. You sh- you shove each other. Maybe someone throws a punch, whatever. You let it go. They're grown men. They're pros. This happens to every team in the league. And I would honestly rather, and I think Kane and Perron both said this afterwards, you'd rather see this and people thinking that it's, you know, all happiness and rainbows after like a or a lackadaisical practice, right? So I was I was fine with it, and maybe they can actually you know convert that into something for next game. I'm grasping at straws here, but if this team was six and zero right now, and the same thing happened, we wouldn't hear a single thing about this. But the fact that everything's been culminating and so gloomy lately, and they're on a six game losing streak, and then it happens, it becomes you know a talking point and. I don't know. I think this is a nothing burger, but, and I actually love to see this. I, this is the thing that we're all complaining about. We're saying this team has no fight and there's, they're not coming out with any energy. So if we're going to see it in practice, I'm hoping that that's sort of the spark. And to me, this is great. This is exactly what I want to see. I don't want anyone to get hurt, but I want that level of competition at practices. And I think Ben Schrott has been always known as a guy who takes practice very seriously what happens next game? If Ben Sherrod comes out and lays an absolute egg, then I'm going to have some problems. <laughs> but the fact that there's somebody out there, or him and Raymond out there at practice, who are, are it's the frustrations are boiling over, I love to see it. I want more of it. 99 out of 100 times, I'm in a 1,000% agreement with Evan. St. Louis, who was it? Robert Bertuzzo and someone else got into a full-fledged like fight, throwing bombs the year they won the Cup. It's intensity. It's competitiveness. It's what you want. You want hard practices. You want 
guys to keep everybody honest. And that sort of, you know, practice mentality translates to a game and I love it. But as I already alluded to earlier, not even 16 hours before this practice, Ben Trotz out there laying an egg, throws two hits the whole game. After the scrum from the video we saw, Schrott looked like he didn't have a care in the world. It was Lucas Raymond who was pissed off and was going at him and circling back and beaking at him. Schrott seemed like he couldn't be bothered. Well, to deal with, which maybe which he is, knew it was done, which right? is fine. But that's not intensity. That's not Raymond was the one showing the intensity there. And if I'm watching Ben Sherratt throw out just the absolute no give a shit level he did Tuesday night, but then he's going to stand in front of the net at practice the next day. And I, we don't know what caused it. Throw cross checks into Lucas Raymond or be like very aggressive with him physically, whatever they were doing. Where the hell was that the night before? That's the only part of this that drives me nuts. If the Red Wings had won, you know, Tuesday night and Sherratt had an okay game, or even if he didn't, but he threw like six hits, big hits, I'm okay with this. I'm with Evan. It's a nothing burger. Ben Sherratt's a goal scorer, I'll have yeah. you know. So yeah. uh, he, he's got the puck more. It's <laughs> You can't hit people when you've got possession. Yeah, but I think he'd be more who, appreciative of the pass. That yeah, I was going to say, who <laughs> gave him that pass? But the context of this all, and again, even if we circle back to our first conversation of, if the Red Wings are losing six in a row because the PDO bender just flipped, they're playing hard, nothing's going in, can't get a sit. It happens. But you're going to combine this absolute stretch of no give a shit and then practice is the time you decide, oh, yeah, 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 no, I'm going to be an asshole to our 21-year-old top forward right now. Like, give me a break. And again, 99 out of 100 times, this is a nothing burger. Evan's a 1,000% right. But this is the one out of 100 because we've had this team that doesn't even care to be on the ice. And this, this is the time you decide to give a shit. Like, I... It rubs me the wrong way. It's not anything that, oh, they should be scratching Sherratt or, you know, whatever. It's not that, but it's just so annoying because of everything around it. See, I, I disagree. For I think you're right, first of all, to, to call it what you're right about. Like, yeah, Sherratt had a, a bad game and it's frustrating from the perspective of like everything that happened before the practice and then the practice. You're like, all right, what the hell? And if he comes out, and as you and Evan pointed out, lays an egg again, then you're like, sorry, then you don't get the luxury of doing this. But where I disagree is, as frustrating as it might be to see in the moment, to me, it's like, I, I don't care that Lucas Raymond is 21. And Lucas Raymond has has a nose for the dirty area, too. He can handle it. He's a, he's, and to be fair, we don't know who started this. Yeah, like he's we're just assuming boy. it was Sherrod just because it looked like they were working on some D-zone stuff. But it seemed like know. It seemed like a... a like, no one got hurt. It wasn't, like, no one threw a sucker or anything. So I'm actually very okay with it, despite the fact, like, even with the fact that it's Raymond. If it was Cider, I wouldn't care. If it was Berggren, I wouldn't care. I would rather see something than nothing. And you know what? Like, Ben Sherratt has, at points, really improved his game this season. I think he's paired with Jeff Petrie, and I, I, I don't want to see that pair together anymore. Like, I just don't. I try not to harp on on players, like, that hard when the whole team is bad, but you just can't have that pair together anymore. I'll, I'll withhold judgment to think it's anything. I agree with Evan. I think it's nothing until we see what happens after. Like, if the guys get frustrated and you, you're you a little bit of a dick, whichever one of them it was, and you shove someone, cross-check one, punch, punch someone at practice, I've done it in practice. I'm okay with it. I don't know. I understand what you're saying, Brad, but to me, it's like every they're all big boys out there. They can handle themselves. It didn't look to be anything too bad. We're also missing like probably a lot of context. Oh, as yeah. A, yeah, yeah. There's probably someone could have done something stupid on the plane last night, and Ben Trout's like, I'm I'm done with this. Tomorrow's practice. You stole my Catan pieces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You you traded with Wallman. You traded a, your sh you bought a sheep for wheat. That's stupid. Yeah. No wheat, you lose. I think next game. If Ben Sherrod is really bad next game, then or Lucas Raymond are really bad next game, I'm going to hold every both of them accountable equally because I don't have the context. Then, then we start. I start thinking about it a little bit more. But right now, I don't. I'm I think it was a battle that got heated. I, yeah, I, exactly. I don't even care if Ben Sherrod plays good. 
he better try and lay out at least three guys in that first period. Yeah. That, that's my point. It's like you're not hitting the opponents. Why? But the, your teammates where you're going to start. Like, it's stupid to me. I think Ben Schrott laying some people probably equates to also then. Like, that would be part of a good game, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. If ben, if Schrott comes out, like you guys said, guns up blazing tomorrow night fantastic everybody's gonna circle this scrum as the turning point in the season phenomenal i hope that's the case weird that it took two weeks and six losses to get to that point you know what if tomorrow's game is great then this is water under the bridge rather than a team that looks like they're falling apart i i hope it was started by raymond saying all right if you go dash four again i'm never giving you a pass in the <laughs> slot again that was your last one All right, we're going to take a break and we'll be back with you on the other side to talk more about the Red Wings. But first, we want to let you know that this episode of the Winged Wheel podcast is proudly brought to you by Labatt Blue Light. Created in 1983, this premium light Canadian Pilsner is a delicately balanced beer brewed with Cascade hops and a blend of malt. It's fresh, crisp, and brewed to the highest quality standards. There's a little bit of Canadian kindness in every sip of Labatt Blue Light. How did it get in there? They're Canadian. That's how. You can spread the love yourself by sharing a Labatt. And when you do share a Labatt, you're not just sharing a beer. You're sharing an experience that'll pair with anything from hockey to a hoedown. So next time you're watching a hockey with your buds, be sure to share a Labatt because while you might not all root for the same team, although we on this podcast do hope you're rooting for the Red Wings, you can all enjoy a Labatt Blue Light. We honestly love going to games in Detroit and seeing Labatt being the beer that fans clamor for all over the arena. It's a reliable beer and great to have in your hand when celebrating a goal. So head to the link in the description of this episode or the one you see on your screen to find Labatt in stores near you today. You must be 21 or older and as always, enjoy responsibly. All right, welcome back. More conversation about the Red Wings. You know, what I said at the top of the show, of I, I've come to understand and accept a lot of what this Red Wings team is and, you know, First off, as we mentioned, I think the Dylan Larkin injury just there, even though we've talked about it at length and amplified it to the nth degree, there really isn't a way to articulate properly how massive the downstream effects of his injury like were all across the lineup. And I'm not just talking about on, you know, on the four offensive lines. Like, yeah, that, that was a big one facilitated so much of the play with with Kane and Debrinket and you know allowing Raymond to be on the second line and everyone was kind of slotting in compared to what their actual position or or level of play should have them at. That's one thing. Secondly, the Red Wings were able to generate more offense, had way better team defense. We know Larkins play at both ends of the ice and they could cover for their defense a little bit better. Not that they were ever exceptional defensively, but they could cover for it a little bit better. The goalies don't get shelled for as many shots. The goalies have a little bit more time to settle in, maybe get hot, whatever. Reimer, you know, a lot of his games where he did happen to come in clutch. If you watched him play, it wasn't exactly calm watching, but he was able to make the save. But that doesn't happen if Detroit's getting dominated up and down the ice. But really what I've I've come to accept is that there's two perspectives on this on the entire season, and I think both are extremely valid. First, in this moment in time, like this tangent in the season – you know, 65 games in, it is okay. Like, there's no way you can sell the way the Red Wings have been playing as actually a good thing. It is okay to be livid with the fact that the Red Wings lost six in a row in this fashion. We talked about it. It's it's how they've been losing that is angering for fans. It's how these losses have come. It's the opponents they've lost to. It's the effort you've seen on the ice. Like, I don't think you could reasonably sit there and say that anyone who's mad about that is unjustified because the expectations this season were never uh, at this level. Like there is no way that you see a team perform as they did for most of this season play like this. And you're like, Oh yeah, but that's, that's okay. And that's, uh, you know, normal and good. And you can reasonably expect them to come out of it in these last 17 games. It's bad. It's bad. Even if you have the most optimistic view, they've been playing terrible hockey by and large. The other perspective is, as I just mentioned, the expectation this season was that we would never have thought the Red Wings would have that much of a cushion that they had two weeks ago as they did. We never would have been confident in saying that they will make the playoffs 
after, you know, 59 games or whatever it was. We never would have imagined that the Red Wings would have like been this strong. We talked about possibilities of them being a playoff contender in terms of like a fringe wildcard spot, but really positionally, if at the start of the season we said, hey, on Wednesday, March 13th, the Red Wings will be at 72 points tied with the second wildcard spot in points. Happy or no? Thrilled. Thrilled. We would have been thrilled. Those two things aren't mutually exclusive. One doesn't negate the other. This poor play doesn't negate the immense success in terms of progress that you've seen from this team that we saw earlier this year. It doesn't negate the immense success in the, the standings, but I digress. But those perspectives are both fair and valid. And I think you can hold both at once. And that's where I'm at. Like when we do a review of the season, whether we're talking about a playoff round or not, I think it's perfectly fair to hold both of those perspectives. The one perspective I get hung up on, and this is where, where in my opinion, I really want to push back on is when people say, if they made the playoffs, they'd lose in the first round anyway. So do you even want that? And to that, I say, yeah, you want that. Yeah, you want that because the direction Eisenman took with this team was to try to make the playoffs sooner rather than later. So that has to be the goal. And when you sniff it, when you, you get a, a smell or a taste for blood, you want that. Like, you don't back off of that. That's a loser mentality. You want your team to make it. If Detroit makes the playoffs and gets swept, you'll be frustrated after they get swept. But by and large, you'll be way happier that they've made it than if they were on, you know, the the outs, the first or second team out of the playoffs. Way better that they make it. That's the one thing where I'm like, that's the mentality I can't agree with. Yeah, I, we always talk about, you know, playoff it, Teams trade for guys or sign free agents purely based on the fact Pat Maroon is still in the NHL purely based on the fact that all he does is he's got Stanley Cups. Like the Red Wings making the playoffs is experience and it's valuable experience whether they win the Stanley Cup or they get swept in the first round and it's a waste of seven days like Daryl Sutter always says. Missing the playoffs... I mean, we. I said this team would be seventh in the division. Whoops, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> There's still time. There's still time. You know, the the cosmic energies work in mysterious ways. But missing the playoffs just by by a fraction, given everything we've seen right now, would be devastating for the fans. And man, I hope there's some lessons the team could take out of it. But at this point, on March 13th, if they can make the playoffs, I think it would be a huge boost, especially for the young guys on the team. So context matters a lot in this conversation. I'm glad you said it, Ryan, because you're right. If you had airdropped us onto this date and we didn't know anything about how we got here and you said we're tied for the last wild card spot, we'd be doing backflips. We'd be like, yes, a thousand percent. We will take that. Yes. But the context is how we got here. It's yeah. the how we said when they had that believe it at the time was an eight or a nine point cushion on a playoff spot. If they don't make it now, it's the, one of the greatest collapses in the salary cap era. Prashanth was referencing the 13, 14 Leafs absolute catastrophe. Red Wings are mirroring that right now. We thought if they fell out of the playoffs at all, it would be a monumental collapse. We, in our minds, when we said that, we're thinking, Maybe they fall out of it, like just creeps up on them in the last week of the season. Someone overtakes them and it was just kind of death by a thousand cuts. It took two weeks. Yeah. Like that, this isn't yeah bad. This isn't like this is catastrophically bad hockey. And again, not to rehash the entire conversation we already had, the how they're losing this game matters. And then on top of that, there's the whole context of the last two off seasons. This is a team coming out of a rebuild with two players under the age of 24. That is a problem in and of itself, but the offset to that problem is you get playoff experience for a ton of players who haven't had it yet. Your Lucas Raymond's Mo Siders, Michael Rasmussen's, et cetera, et cetera. You delay probably to a hindrance a lot of the rookies coming into the lineup to gain valuable playoff experience. If Eisman goes out and makes all these signings, and all this money and puts them in this salary cap problem and they don't make the playoffs, it's a problem. We are basing this off what 
our expectations were at the beginning of the year. We looked at this team on paper and went, maybe there's a chance. Don't love the chance, but there's a chance. Iserman made these moves and had higher expectations than we did, which is what we got to remember in this conversation. He doesn't sign all these five-year, four, five, six million dollar deals to middle six players with the expectation being, ah, we played meaningful games in March. So if they miss the playoffs this year, what's the plan going forward? You can't go out and sign more of these contracts. He's already backed himself into a corner salary cap wise. And before everybody starts freaking out, there are so many easy ways to wriggle your way out of this cap situation, but it's going to cost you. Whether that be buyouts or sweeteners to unload this contract, he can get out of it. I'm well aware of that. But if they miss, do you take a step backwards to free up spots for Edvinson, Johansson, Mazer, Casper, Danielson, who the hell ever? Do you go three, four rookies next year? Because that is the path and this method isn't sustainable. I think the conversation will have to be had in the offseason. I think money will push you in that direction one way or another. Yeah, because, because you have to you have to have cheap roster spots. Exactly. So, you know, there's a good chance that the Red Wings make the playoffs this year and miss the playoffs next year. Because, like you said, you have to get younger at some point. You have to have some ELCs in there to help solve some of the cap issues. Oh, and by the way, does anybody think New Jersey and Buffalo and Ottawa are going to be this bad again next year? No, they're all going to be better. So, and how many teams above them look like they're going to fall right now? None. So. I don't know. It's it's all about, yeah, the expectation is, in all the conversations we have, are our expectations based on what we thought at the beginning of the year. That's us. We're nobodies. We're idiots. The organization had higher expectations than us. And I will tell you, sitting there with an eight or a nine point cushion on a playoff spot and then missing in March, you think that's going to go over poorly with us? Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, there's... Yeah, I, like the Arizona game from uh, way back, like the the real drubbing from forever ago, where that was the image where they got Eisman grinding his jaw. And after that offseason, like so many players left and all those changes were made. We should just have an ISO cam on Eisman for this losing streak. Like he is absolutely the angriest person in the world to Steve Eisman about this losing streak. A thousand percent. So like I said, we can say all we want and have all our expectations and airdrop us onto this state. It doesn't matter. We're probably not even close to as mad as Steve is right now. Yeah. The, again, like I just can't get over when people are like, oh, they were just because they were doing good. Doesn't mean you can you know, be angry about this. No, man. Fans devote time and energy and, uh, you know, ticket prices across the NHL have gone pretty high. It is not cheap to go to a game. It's not cheap to eat or drink at a game. It's not cheap to park at a game. Like people devote a lot to this. And if you're going to put forward a team that, you know, flirts with the playoffs and then has that much of a cushion. I'm not the kind of person where I'm like, fire Eisman, fire Lillard. Like, no, like you have to have some measure of of reason. But if you're like, hey, they're playing god-awful hockey, and I'm even if the expectation at the start of the season was that we'd be happy with this raw number with no context, I'm mad considering the context of how terrible they've been playing. I am, like, that is your job as a fan to be mad at this kind of hockey. So I I don't, I just don't like when people are like, oh, it's actually not, it's better to not make the playoffs or uh, it, it's unreasonable to be frustrated with this. I think it's unreasonable to go like, oh, sell Lucas Raymond and trade everyone and blah, blah. No, that is just like the walk up, walk back yourself up from the ledge. Yeah. But it is perfectly fine to have with this team sniffed the playoffs and then be upset that they're not there anymore. So that's just like a. I'm not going to tell anybody how they should feel about this situation. No. You want to be pissed off, and that's part of fandom. That's man. about being a fan. Like, yeah. not everybody's going to have the same, you know, idea of how the team should move going forward. You know, we're all armchair GMs and armchair head coaches, and we're all superstar first line centers. I'm not going to tell people top pair right D, but exactly, yeah. you know. I'm not going to tell people to say, "Oh, don't be upset about the current state of affairs over the the last of the season," or "Your get off your high horse." Uh, you know, you feel the way you want to feel about it. Some people have a longer perspective and are able to see the forest for the trees and aren't as concerned about you know this immediate moment. And some people are living in the moment. I, it's perfectly fine both ways. Yeah. So, 
you know, you saw kind of all of it last uh, over the last little bit. And, you know, we've had the this team has had the highest of highs and the lowest of lows, I think, of any team in the NHL yeah. this year. Yeah. So the fact that everybody's kind of at odds with one another and sort of the expectations and being, you know, that's a little bit subjective. You know, I think it's all part of the Red Wings experience of uh, 2023, 2024. Right, I'll take this over the apathy of the late 2010s. I'll tell you that much. Yep. Okay, let's move off the Red Wings. They have three games to uh, maybe make the conversation a little bit more positive next episode. Next episode will be, like, crazy. If if it goes bad next episode, Brad might just not park his car, might just drive it straight through the front of my house, get out, and come sit in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> I'm broadcasting directly from the driver's seat. <laughs> well, let's break. get this over with, and I'm getting out of here as quickly as I can. Or if it's three wins, it's just... An hour straight of the longest sigh of relief in human history. Yeah, your chest will be like puffed up yeah, this just, big, just holding all the air. And first half of the episode is just. <sighs> <sighs> <laughs> all right, let's get into the rest of the NHL. Brad, we haven't argued enough today, I don't think. Expansion. Atlanta has now made a public statement following suit from uh, Utah previously. We've seen Atlanta make some noise through, you know, some very specific uh, uh, hockey reporters and insiders. We know that project is trying to drum up interest for themselves, and they've made a statement asking the NHL to uh, consider an expansion round. The NHL loves this stuff, not because they want to expand or don't want to expand, because it drums up interest and then it pushes the price up. The next expansion round will be north of a billion, and that's a, might even be conservative. Uh, in terms of an entry fee, but Atlanta is the latest to be in there. We've heard a lot of names recently, so I, I don't want to talk about the merits of Atlanta as a, an expansion location. We know money is going to dictate this. The conversation we've had before is how many teams is too many teams, and I was very anti going from thirty to thirty two. I feel like talent is stretched right now. I know the league is headed for more. I still maintain what I say. I think they're going to 36. They're barreling towards it. It's just too much money to pass up. The owners, as we've seen from jersey ads and, and ticket prices and everything else, they love money. And if you can charge $1.5 billion for a new team to come in, you're going to do it. But how much is too much for the league and the competition and the fans? The real answer is nobody knows. You won't know till you hit it. We haven't hit it yet. On the talent conversation, I have a hard time accepting that argument you we've all watched griffin's games the ahl is good there are good hockey players not guys who are going to come in and score 80 points in the nhl but you could take five guys off the griffins right now plug them into the detroit red wings right now knock off five guys from the bottom of the roster nobody would really notice the difference and it wouldn't happen quickly but if you have you know four five six more teams out there the top end talent starts to get spread out a little more rather than just being entirely on Tampa and Toronto and Colorado. <laughs> and Vegas. And Vegas. Well, they would, Vegas. Is they different. would, they, they would, would still, they would still. They yeah, would still. Yeah. And, and I'm okay with that. You know, I'm a big proponent of grow the game. You know, I'm a hockey lifer in every sense of the word. So you're not dispersing fan the same number of fans over 36 teams you're getting new fans in utah and atlanta and houston wherever the hell they end up you're adding fans to the game which as we saw with austin matthews in arizona will create more players look at the hockey player movement coming out of california now that the early 90s boom starting to hit the nhl there's talent there and you know it's a generational thing i'm not saying all these players are going to crop up quickly but over time if a market succeeds it does create a bigger talent pool and it's more entertainment it's more rivalries it allows for more exciting possibilities over the time i've firmly talked myself into a play-in being a good thing like I, even if they don't expand i think i'm still in huge favor of it but if you have a 36 team league you can still have the exact same playoffs you have now but you can have more excitement in how you get in, right? You have 20 teams, quote unquote, make the playoffs with the bottom four teams or five or pick whatever arbitrary number you want, having a play in to get into the Stanley Cup playoffs. Now, that's another layer of excitement. 
leading up to the playoffs. It creates two phenomenal races for the playoffs because now you're racing to get above the standings on the play-in and you're racing to get into the play-in. So everybody's got this, rather than this one cutoff, you have two cutoffs, which is more entertainment. And the whole thing is, it's all arbitrary. Like, there's no reason why the league should be 20 or 30 or 40. I think you're right in the talent pool will be the biggest determinant of that. And some markets will succeed, some markets will fail. But guess what? We, as Red Wings fans, if we want to be selfish about this, we cheer for a big market team. More money in the system means a bigger salary cap, which means the big spending teams have an advantage. We're one of them. I'm very much in favor of that. Now, before anybody starts yelling me in the comments, because I can hear it already, Atlanta is not a team I'm supporting to get an expansion. I, You've had two cracks. I have zero faith. Yes, but remember, third time's the charm. Yeah. Money, I'm, money, I'm, money, 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 money. I'm not saying it's impossible for Atlanta to succeed this time. Let's just call me skeptical. But yeah, I don't, other than it's enough, I haven't heard a single argument against expansion other than the talent pool one, which I understand. I just don't think we're at that threshold yet. There's I'm still- watching like one and a half serviceable defensemen on Detroit on any given night. It hurts, man. And yet we have what, two, three in our farm system, but I digress. But also, hey, we've all watched junior hockey. If you water down the talent a little bit, it creates a little more chaos, which creates a more entertaining product. Like, it's like when Nathan McKinnon gets out there against Jeff Petrie. You know something cool is going to (laughs) happen. Yeah. For one team. (laughs) It's very cool for one team. You're right. I'm going to argue your point to enhance it here. Like, that is exactly right, Brad, because defense and goalies are going to be the two parts of the talent pool that are going to get hit the hardest. And when defense gets worse and goaltending gets worse, offense goes up, entertainment goes up, money goes up, and that's, I think, generally the direction. Like, look how much better the league is performing now that goaltending save percentages have gone down by design over the past few years. Now, something I will say, and I don't know if this is a good argument or not, but I think about this a lot. You already have, not actually, but on paper, a 1 in 32 shot of winning the Stanley Cup. Do we really want to keep diluting that? Our fan bases, are we comfortable with fan bases for entire generations? Like you're going to, people are going to go lifetimes and their team's never going to win a cup. Are we happy about that? Yes, absolutely. One, it makes the cup more valuable. The harder it is to get, it's the hardest trophy to win in sports and hockey fans will brag till the day they die about it, but then make it harder. Oh no, 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 but it's, I'm okay with it for two reasons. One, it, the harder something is, the more valuable it is. And two, yeah, Gleep. Yeah, I met. <laughs> nice. But you look at all the misery Leafs fans, for example, have had. They haven't won a Stanley Cup since 1967. Counterbalance that with all the joy every other fan base has had making fun of Leaf fans for not winning it since <laughs> 1967. So it's the same amount of happiness. It's just how it gets dispersed. The Leafs could actually win more cups with more teams because if the talent gets dispersed, but they're good at, you know, retaining talent, they'll beat up on a lot more teams. No, Toronto will probably get a cup once the league expands to 36, 38, 40 teams, whatever it is. It'll, it'll be the, be, second, Toronto it'll be the second Toronto team that expands. Oh, um, I have no, you have no idea the pure joy that would bring me. <laughs> I want to add, I'm not going to fight expansion straight up, but I'm going to add a point that we haven't really discussed in this is the fact that you know expansion is the easy way of making more money it's it's the dumb person way of the league making more money you want we want to make money oh let's just add more teams okay there's two billion dollars all the owners are happy it's like a stimulus package for the it's a stimulus package i think the nhl needs to take a serious look into actually using They've got people who are exceptional business men, women, leaders. They need to put their brains together and think of the difficult ways that they can make more money. And here's an easy one. Get rid of blackouts. Oh, okay. oh. there's an easy one. I and you know what? I, I won't I'm not for expansion. You're I'll making just say me that, more but valuable this is, right now. But this is yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is not I'm not saying we shouldn't expand and we should just do this instead. I'm not seeing the NHL do, m- coming up with ideas to make more money as a 32 team organization. This problem will continue as a 34, 36 team 
league. I need to see them try more advanced, more business savvy things before I can be convinced that this league is actually good at making more money because One. everything's got more expensive. The fact that the revenue's up, shocker. So is the grocery stores. So go outside, see how much a car costs. Everything is up. So I don't totally buy that. I would rather see them try to make some some interesting changes in the ways to grow their business at the current size first. That's the best point you've ever made. No, Evan's objectively right. In the offseason, we could do a three-part series as to how poorly the NHL is run and all the opportunities they miss and all the dumb shit like blackouts they do. Like, that is a thousand percent a factual statement, but that doesn't prevent expansion you're gonna have the same problems with the 30 32 36 40 it's gonna be the same at least expansion is one way of getting money and evan's correct the lazy way of getting money the dumb guy way of getting money but guess what the nhl is the dumb guy of sports leagues so they've the dumb guy way of making money is better than not making more money and again it's new markets that's the part it's you are not dispersing the same amount of hockey fans you have now you are not dispersing the same amount of dollars you have now. You are adding whole new demographics into this pool. And again, are they going to maximize what they could do with that? Absolutely not. It's the NHL. They're horrible. But like I said, and I, I think they can still do that without expanding. Oh, they and, absolutely could. And this is, you know, this, They're all, not going this to, comes back, could. you know, to the the whole conversation about the Olympics and all that. And they say they grow the game. Well, you don't really, because domestically you can't even figure that out. So how could you possibly do it when the Olympics are in China or in Russia or in Italy? Like, I don't believe a thing they say. Yeah. Maybe I'm asking too much of the people who've made billions and billions of dollars to come up with a new original idea or, you know, look at the other leagues that are passing you by or don't even have, Gary Bettman in their address ebook and their phone anymore. Like, take a look at what they're doing. Think of some things that you can do to separate yourself from on a business perspective before you just always go to the dumb guy way. Are you asking too much of even an average businessman? No, absolutely not. All very reasonable requests. Do either of you even have the slightest shred of hope that anything Evan's requesting is going to happen? No, because regime. they're so stuck in their ways. Exactly. And like we're we just talked for a long like this is a long time about how the NHL can make more money. All three of us don't actually care if billionaires make more money. We're no. saying make this better for fans, but hey, if you're actually so concerned about making more money, here's how you could do that better. Yeah. It I know it I kind of pulled us off the main point there a little bit yeah, in like a very you. direct no. argument, but I that's my instead of just planting my flag and saying expansion's dumb blah 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 i'm trying to offer a different perspective for once than always i i will still plant my flag for the salary cap but i'm trying to <laughs> trying to think differently Evan, for Evan, this one. it's too late in the episode to have the salary yeah cap too many changes no. at once not gonna no, work and even once a year in the off season okay and again evan's right about all these more complicated issues but even basic like Fix Arizona before you expand I, to a new and team. And you know what? I but didn't even bring that up. Yeah, but they're not going to. So my whole argument on Evan's very correct point is they're not going to. So this is probably the only way they're going to get more money. I... And also, I don't think one precludes the other. Like, you can fix all these things and still do this. Just as like a final point here, do you know what the biggest decider is in terms of what locations are most likely to get an NHL market? Who ponies up the most money for the expansion fee? It's where the billionaires live. Yeah. It's where the billionaires want to operate business. It's not which... Hold on. Winnipeg has a team. Well, and, <laughs> and look, they're in crisis right now. They're a great team and their season ticket sales are declining. This is fair. Because they, like, I'm sorry, but Winnipeg, Manitoba does not have the same uh, uh, financial potential or the same amount of billionaires or the same kind of corporate money that Salt Lake City, Utah will have, that Atlanta, Georgia has, that, you know, I'm not even kidding when I say Cleveland, Ohio will have. Like, there are so many other, in terms of populations and the, the GDP and, like, how much money the actual populace has on the business and personal side that's what dictates it. It's yes, you want to you want to go to places to make new hockey fans. That's the fan perspective. 
for the business perspective is you want to go to places where you're not already getting their money, which is why Quebec City is so unlikely, well, which is why a second Toronto team is so unlikely. You're already getting their money. And teams like Winnipeg is where I understand revenue sharing because that was ba- – to me, that's like the last sort of – this is going to sound so bad. It's the last like goodwill organization. You, the DNA was always there for Winnipeg to have an uphill battle to survive as yeah. a franchise. Small city, small arena, corporate sales are not where they should be. But this is where I believe, you know, revenue sharing is a good thing. It's not to prop up the Arizona Coyotes that are an absolute gong show. This is to keep those small market teams or you can continue to have like that grassroots feel to a team. Are you pro expansion if we get the Atlanta Thrashers jerseys back? No. (laughs) <laughs> that's a tough take that's a tough take I loved I was a sucker for the single sleeve though they were so bad they were great I that 100% agree I that I I really like that point Evan it's like a what did I say <laughs> I blacked out I blacked out where am I <laughs> for the listeners that it's genuine he actually does not remember but no that that is the intention of revenue sharing that is a, a not not that some hockey markets are more better just because they're Canadian or they're older teams or more history but no like that's a hockey city. Like they those... always knew that this team would not be the New York Rangers in terms yeah. of the biggest stick or the biggest revenue. They did it because they saw a market that could f- succeed and use the revenue sharing as a way to keep them afloat. Yeah, prop them up a little bit in the lean years, and when they go on runs, they'll make money, and then a couple which, of years they won't. Which they're not. <laughs> they're, what, this is probably the best team we've seen them, yeah, from them in a long time. <laughs> they go three, four rounds deep in the playoffs. That's a lot of money. Exactly. They just got to bring Dustin Bufflin back, man. That He's a pro fisher now, so... It's going to be tough to pull him away from that. He was a pro that. fisher when he played pro <laughs> hockey, too. Hey, he's he's already played in Atlanta once, just saying. That you, <laughs> hey, well, Atlanta's going to want Ben Sherratt back. All right, let's jump into overtime on this episode of the Wing Wheel podcast. We didn't even get to talk about Tortorelli yet. That's a shame. That is a crying we'll, shame. We'll save it for next episode. He wouldn't let us anyway. No. he. I think Torts would be a great podcast guest. It would either have, be the best or the worst. There'd be no, no in between. He'd, he'd either, be awesome. We talked to him about his uh, his dog rescue initiatives. Yeah. He'd fit right in. And then we'd ask him one question about the Flyers. He'd be like, next. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, how do you think Bowen Byron, he would have, he would throttle us. Anyhow, Overtime is brought to you by our Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. The Discord, the Red Wings home ticket giveaway, and the bonus Overtime episodes are some of the great benefits that you get. You allow us to continue to produce the show and, and make it bigger and better. You allow us to support the Jamie Daniels Foundation and produce more great content like through Expected by Whom. Hosted by Prashanth Iyer and Sean Shapiro. So again, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. Let's take some questions from our patrons. Give Wallman the heart says this isn't a playoff team next year. If we're being honest, I don't expect a quiet off season from Eisenman, but that would require some subtraction before addition. Very correct. So quick. Yes or no. Will these non-expiring UFAs be on the team to start next season? That was a fun game. Petrie. Yes, because his. Clauses make it difficult. He has a full no move, which makes it hard. Hall. No, I think that's a bio candidate. I agree. Hall won't be on here one way or another. Mata. Yes. Fabry. Yes. Bergren. No. Valeno. Yes. There's going to need to be a lot of subtraction before addition. Like I, I agree with the overall sentiment. Like as this team is right now, you're going to need to make some moves, but I also, what you said earlier in the episode, Brad, don't, don't get too cemented into what this team is now. Moves can be made. And I also think the NHL is just getting better in general about moving their rosters around. Nick Odette says, I feel like Kane is just there for the cookies and flashy plays. Even on the OT goal in Chicago, anyone else knows he had bailed on the back check before line into Brink and got him the puck for the breakaway. Would the Wings really be better served by signing this guy, or would it be not be best to get that money's worth in cap space for a bigger and younger foundation player, even if it's one to two years away through UFA or trade? How many goals against was he on four out of the seven last night? Was it none? It was none. I, I understand the point some people are trying to make in terms of not necessarily this one, but like a, a Kane, is that a luxury you can afford? But to me, the talent level is just too high. The talent level is too high to let that walk away. We've talked about it ad nauseum when the times were better, but Kane does bring a substantial amount of talent, which elevates the players around him when things are going well at the very least. 
Sergeant Slim Jim says, after the losing streak and some of the worst hockey I've seen from this team in a while, do you think critics were right that the Wings were overperforming? If so, what does next season look like in terms of roster changes, playoff race, coaching, etc.? Big adjustments, minor tweaks, or a massive overhaul? They were definitely overperforming. I think we might have just underestimated how much they were overperforming by. Uh, see, this might be semantics, but I think they were overperforming the exact amount we were acknowledging the entire time. I think right now they're underperforming severely, severely underperforming. I think we they had a hot goalie, they had a hot like they were extremely efficient shooters. We knew their holes on defense, and we knew that the roster was kind of held together by a couple of key guys. We just didn't really make the right estimate as to how much Larkin's injury would have had an impact. Liz B says, is this the part of the rebuild where they're going to be frustratingly close to the playoffs? That they make us want to rip our hair out. Yeah. I think the off season is going to be more frustrating because I think there's going to be a lot of questions about do they take a step forward or do they take a step backwards? Because the way their team's currently constructed was for short-term gain, not long-term. And if you're taking the long-term view, you can't have all of Edvinson, Mazur, Johansson, Danielson, Casper in the minors again next year. You got to get, I'd say at a bare minimum, two, probably three in the lineup next year. But are you putting that many rookies in the lineup and advancing? I don't know. I I, I would say, yeah, it's possible because God, there's some guys definitely not pulling their weight on the roster right now that could easily be replaced, but couple that with the salary cap issues, how much can you really add as well? Like, are, are they going out and getting that premium significant top six forward that they need this summer? Probably can't without, like you mentioned earlier in the episode, a lot of subtraction. And last one here, Wings fan in St. Louis says, definitely some lack of effort in these last few games. I turned off both the Arizona and Vegas games after the second, primarily because I had to go to work, but it was also disgusted by what I saw in Arizona and not impressed uh, after that. In listening to the Buffalo game, ugh, when Stevie Y was the captain during the cup contention years, I don't remember the team faltering like this, but the quality of the players on the team is a lot better. Can such a team ever be assembled again? I'm thinking like the O2 cup team and I, I just in the modern cap era it's just not happening vegas is trying that like the o2 red wings in terms of what they brought in was is like vegas on steroids on steroids like you just can't do that anymore. it was 10 or 11 hall of famers whatever that was never again and growing as and one, like, once that suit goes in like yeah and this pro- I, I hate to say it because that's my favorite team of all time o2 is my favorite year my favorite team of all time it's probably good for the game that you can't do that. Uh, hard disagree. You, you, oh. That's because yeah. well, it's a disagree. sound cap fight. Hard <laughs> yeah, disagree. We're, we're fans of Detroit, so yeah, Evan's right. But if you were a fan of like Nashville, yeah, it's probably better this way. <laughs> I also, I, I want to stop short of saying you could buy your win because Toronto had a lot of money back then too and they still couldn't do it. Oh, so. they spent a lot of money. They just um, did not have a good general manager and was picking the wrong players. Uh, uh, let's do one more here, actually. Jake I true. It's a little bit of a fun one just to get the, the tone change says, do you guys collect any NHL jerseys outside of wings ones? And if so, what would be a dream Jersey that you would want to get? I came across a Brett Hull coyotes Jersey a few years back and passed up on it. And I regret it every single day. I also recently picked up a coho brand, Minnesota wild Jersey from the first couple of years. And it's a gem. Oh, I already own my dream non red wings Jersey. Hmm. An autographed Pavel Bure spaghetti skate jersey. That's, I don't even like the spaghetti skate, but that's a fun one. That It's so sick. I've, I'm kicking myself for not getting a Gordie Howe Detroit Vipers jersey back in the day when they were more readily available. I love those. If Detroit ever gets like really wild with their jerseys, I would love them to do an homage to the, the Vipers jersey. Or if the PWHL comes, I would love if they could somehow take the Vipers brand. That would be sick. I have none. You're not a big jersey. I'm not a big jersey guy. I think when I was younger, I was probably more, would have been more inclined, but I don't know. I just it's never turned my crank. I like the defunct jerseys too. Okay, I won't say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'll leave it in, okay. but it's questionable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. 
<laughs> you can do with that information as what you, what you want. I don't I, care. I, I'd rather not, Evan. Okay. I'd rather do nothing with that information. I, I honestly can't tell if this episode is hilarious or atrocious. Well, either one. I did my good deed yesterday. I started a, an, a pet trend on Twitter. So You saved the night for a lot of people. I did. I had 200 comments on that tweet. Yeah. All right, folks. We're going to wrap up this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast. Three games before the next one. I'm not going to say anything after that because I don't want to jinx anything, but three games before the next episode. We'll be back with you Sunday night. Thank you all so much for tuning in. And the the good times and the bad. Thank you to Labatt Blue Light for sponsoring this show. And thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. We're all going through this together. To our name level supporters on Patreon, we could not do this without you. Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Grand Foundation. Akefer, Samuel Soderholm, Icon, Brad's Lord and Savior, Bradley Cleveland. Glenn Brabham. Croner's Left Knee, Ashley Van Conant, Sea Lion, Keenan O'Donoghue, Yanni Burgers, Meals on Wheels, Matthew M. Rice, Admiral Matt S. of the Cheeseback Navy, Al the Octopus, brand new name level supporter. Welcome, Al. Carl Brutana Nanoluski, Carl Provi, Sizen High Five, Clip Clop Nene, Connor Scovey, Craig Kibble, Denny's Gamer Girl, Dirk and Stam, DJ Denton, Fear the Goalie, God Creatives, Give Blood Fight Probert, God King Skeletor, brand new name level supporter. Welcome to the Dub Dub Club. Have you ever drank Bailey's from a shoe? Hockey Town Love, Hockey Town Matt, Hassam Al Qasem, I Hate the Ad Patch, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Joel Miranda, Jonathan Miller, Kaylin Wood, Marcus, Marlon Winchester, Matt Keeler, Matt McKay, Mike Ludland, R.A., Red Feather Desert Dogs, Ryan, 50, Hannah Cap, Hannah, Scott Martin, Scree and Lube, That's What I Appreciate's About You, Wallman's Elite Dancing D, Iser Plan Stan, General Andy Bohan of the Cheesebag Army, Sam Bankson, A.B., Adam Rose, Axel Sandy Pelica, Bellingham Acid Balls, Brad Simmons, Brian Vasha, Chuck Buffchest, the Tarpless Goon, Commander Ben Barron of the Cheeseback Space Force, Connor Leighton, Corey Prita, Darren Fick, D-Boss Snip Show, Derek James, Frank Stanley, Gene Sullivan, Griffey Boy, Insert Clever Hockey Pun Here, James Pridemore, Johnny Page, new name level supporter, Jeremiah Dobo, J.M. Rhapsody, Jogan Rafferty Fan Club, John Evans Derogatory, John Ingalls, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Les Grossman's Ungodly Firestorm, Linda Hull, Maximilian, Melissa Erickson, Michigan Boy in Abs Country, Oophelia, Red Wing Tar Heel, Reed, Shahid Syed, Stephen, The Hodag, The Mexinadian, The Hat 123, Wings Fan in St. Louis, ex formerly AA Ron, and your second favorite patron. Thank you all so much. Talk to you Sunday night. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.